the King of Kings. Amen. We glorify and magnify his name. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Everybody well rested? Yeah. That's good. Praise God forevermore. Hallelujah. Thank you, Pam. Let's lift our hands unto the Lord as we prepare our hearts to receive the word of God. The word of God is spirit and life, and Jesus says man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, in the precious name of Jesus, we thank you. We praise you for your most holy word. We thank you that your word will go forth this morning under the anointing and teaching of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, rise up extra big within me. Speak to my lips. Think to my mind. Let the word go forth boldly, accurately, uncompromisingly with power and love. And let it minister to all the needs of the people. I thank you and praise you, Father. My preaching and teaching is not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power. So that their faith should rest not in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. We ask for understanding of the scriptures to clearly reveal to us the things you would have for us this day, that the name of Jesus be glorified and magnified, and that the word of God have free course. And in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the head of the church, Satan, we bind you. We break your power. Every father with an unclean spirit, every spirit of tiredness and fatigue, go from this place right now in the name of Jesus. We loose right now the power, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, we lose the ministering angels, the love, the peace, the joy of the Lord in Jesus' name. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. Let's thank the Lord and praise him. Amen. Let's open up our Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Praise God forevermore. Hallelujah. The mornings teaching is different from the evening teaching. And then sometimes it's a combination of both. At the same time, just let the Holy Spirit have his way. Can you say amen? amen. Praise God. He's, he's in charge, so we just follow him. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, first verse starts out with, but know this. But know this. Know what? That in the last days, and that's where you and I are now in, we're in the last days, perilous times will come. Perilous times are times of stress. Great stress is coming upon the world, and stress is already on the world. Stress is upon individuals. You hear people getting treated for stress. The blood pressure goes up, and the physical body experiences a lot of pressure on it. The mind, a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure, and that's what stress is. It's, it's pressure. It's pressure, and this pressure is brought supernaturally by Satan and demons. Yes, there's natural stress, but then the press stress that is coming is supernatural, supernatural, coming from the kingdom of darkness, not from the kingdom of God. But Jesus tells us in, keep your finger here because we're not through here in this particular uh, chapter, turn over to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, praise God forevermore, hallelujah, glory be to God. With stress comes frustration. People get frustrated. They don't know what to do. They just throw up their hands. And depression, discouragement, all of this comes with stress. And Jesus tells you and I in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy but laden. And notice it says, all you who labor. Labor what? Laboring out of our own strength. We can sometimes wear ourselves out mentally, physically, emotionally trying to make something happen, trying to make something change in our particular life. And we get to the point where we're just so worn out that even if we accomplish what we're trying to accomplish or we see the manifestation of what we have believed God for, we're too worn out to enjoy it. 
because we're without strength. And that frustration had become so great in our particular lives that you get to the point, it doesn't matter anymore. And that happens sometimes in the things of God. It doesn't matter anymore. No, it should matter. Because what God says he's going to do in our particular lives, he's going to perform it. Because God is faithful. And this is where Psalm 37 tells you and I. Now, keep your finger here. We run out of fingers. We go to those good old toes. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Let's go to Psalm 37 a minute. Psalm 37. Praise God for evermore. Hallelujah. And the stress in the world is going to become greater. The word of God tells us that. Can you say amen? But in Psalm 37, let's start at verse 3. Psalm 37. Starts with trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. That is very, very powerful. Because the Bible lets you and I know that Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. There's a saying, there's one particular preacher used to always preach. He says, you don't have any problems. The only thing you need to do is trust in God. And that's true. Trust in God. Put our faith in God. Can you say amen? So it says, trust in the Lord and do good. And do good. You know, you and I have been ordained to do good works. By grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. And we've been ordained to do good works. And notice it says, dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Now, notice the word feed. I think everybody is really familiar with that word. <laughs> feed. Can you say amen? That means to continually partake of, continually eat, and put ourselves in remembrance and declare consistently that God is faithful. And the God kind of faithfulness is not the man kind of faithfulness. God kind of faithfulness is without fail, God's going to do what he says he's going to do. Amen. And one of the things that we should all do is go back and look at how faithful God has been to us over the years and start thanking him for his faithfulness. You know, one thing that God had to do is do with Israel. He had to take them all the way back to Egypt Remind them what they came out of, what, him, what he took them through, and how he blessed them. Because, see, sometimes there's a tendency for men and women to forget. Even the word of God. The Bible tells us not to be forgetful hearers. In, eh, let's go on a little bit. Yes, okay, Holy Spirit. Keep your finger here. Go into the toes now. Go over to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 15. Deuteronomy chapter 15. Praise God forevermore. Deuteronomy chapter 15. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The Lord is good. Is this the one I want, Lord? Praise God. No, the one that I want is, I think it's Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Let's go over there. I think that's the one I want. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. But 15 is good, too. All right. Yeah, Deuteronomy chapter 8. And let's look at verse 10. When we go through stress, and that stress is re it's relieved. In other words, we have the manifestation of what we believe God for. Sometimes there's a tendency for us to just rest, rest, rest. And I'm not talking about resting in God. You see, when there's crisis, there's lots of prayer. <laughs> there's a lot of seeking God. But when that crisis is over, it's sometimes we put away that prayer. We put away that seeking and we just kind of, we're just kind of there. And this is where the Lord tells you and I in Deuteronomy chapter 8, 
verse 10. When you have eaten and are full, what happens when you're full? You go to sleep. <laughs> you don't feel like doing much. Can you say amen? My good friend over here, he can really give you a revelation of being full. <laughs> Praise God. And it says here, when you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. In other words, you've eaten, you're full. It's time to really praise God. We praise him when we were in the crisis, but now it's really time to praise God because we're acknowledging what he has done. We are feeding on his faithfulness, reminding ourselves of how faithful he has been, how he has carried us through this and given us the victory. But then in verse 11, there's what you call admonition, a warning. It says, beware. Now, when you see a sign, beware, I remember as a child, I would go up to someone's property that wasn't our property, and there was a sign, beware. This means you, private property. That means don't come in here, okay? Doesn't mean you're afraid, but it's saying there's a warning. It's, it's not good for you to come in here. This is private property, okay? So you get away from that private property. It says beware that you do not forget. Now there's the word forget. The Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes, which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold are multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, wow, great abundance, multiplication. Boy, things are going so good. Verse 14, when your heart is lifted up, this is where pride comes in. Look what I have done. This happens. Oh, people cried unto the Lord, and the Lord heard their cry. But as things start multiplying, things become so good, it's look what I have done. That's when a person's heart gets lifted up. See, that's two aspects of pride. First is self-exaltation, okay? We're most familiar with that. Well, the second aspect, actually there's three. Second aspect is, look what I've done. Look what I have accomplished, okay? And the third is the most dangerous. That aspect is we start doing things our way and not God's way. We're not following the ways of God anymore. This is where the Bible warns us in the last days about lawlessness. Lawlessness. Most people think lawlessness is I go out here and I speed and they give me a ticket or I break the law. No. Lawlessness is when you and I break God's word, where we start doing things our way and not the ways of God. Sometimes people get into high positions and God got them in that high position and they know that. But they start manipulating. They start manipulating people, doing all kind of things to people to even profit greater. That's what lawlessness is. And that's what the Bible talks about. Lawlessness will increase. And lawlessness is just simply not doing things God's way. We start doing things our way. Before, we would apply the key truth in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, 6, and 7, where it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways, in all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. And verse 7 starts with, Be not wise in your own eyes. No, we have applied that. It's become a part of us. But now, 
that were lifted up. It's great multiplication. We're so wise. We put that aside. We don't apply that truth anymore in our particular life. Because see, God tells us about his ways. He tells us about his thoughts. He tells us about his ways. And he says that my ways are much higher than your ways. And what you and I do, we learn the ways of God through the word of God. And we start doing things his way. We start applying truth like the word of God says. But we get away from it. Boy, you all got so quiet on me out there. Okay? Lawlessness. Lawlessness. That's one of the signs of the, of the last days. Sometimes churches do that. They start out following the ways of God, and then they come with all kind of schemes and all kind of manipulation of the people. Okay? And the church itself becomes lawless. Is it, it doesn't follow God's way of doing things. You all follow what I'm saying? So, like leadership. Leadership is the Holy Spirit is the leader. You can see that in the, in the word of God. Can you say amen? He is the leader. And uh, what you call ministry officials, uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, church leaders are to follow the Holy Spirit. You see the relationship really clear in Acts chapter 15 when false doctrine was brought in. And you see how the elders came together with the Holy Spirit. And they came up with, we're not to do these things. It's good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Everybody see that. But it's following the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes in churches and ministries, people get away from that. And they get into all these things of manipulation and um, what do you call it? Um, praise God. Respecter of person. All these particular things. And that church, that ministry becomes a victim of lawlessness. We're more wiser than God. No, just take in an area. I don't know why I'm getting into this this morning, but God is good. Can you say amen? amen. Being filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, when you look in the Word of God, people received Jesus, and they got filled with the Holy Ghost straight away. But man comes in, and says, no, we'll get you saved, but we won't get you filled with the Holy Ghost now. Because you won't understand. So you have to take a five-week course, then you can be filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, that's not the way of God. That's the way of men. And what has happened in the church all over the world, where there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, people speaking in tongues, signs and wonders and miracles, the wisdom of man has come in and shut all of that down. And most churches, and I'm talking about charismatic churches, Pentecostal churches, don't get people filled with the Holy Ghost. Mainly is because the leaders don't know how. Because they've passed on from one generation to the next generation to the next generation. And it's like, hmm, there's no more. Holy Spirit speaking in tongues, signs and wonders and miracles. This is where the wisdom of men has replaced the wisdom of God. This is where the leadership of men have replaced the leadership of the Holy Spirit. There's no more conferring with the Holy Spirit. I don't know why I got into that, but God is good. Can you say amen? And that's what you call lawlessness. It's not doing it God's way. You know, one of the key revelations that you find in the Word of God is on the day of Pentecost. First of all, Jesus just told them, go and wait in Jerusalem. And they were obedient to do that. And they were seeking God. And then, as they were seeking God, all of a sudden, 
They were sitting. Notice I said sitting. Praise God. Some people think you can only get some from God standing or kneeling. <laughs> okay. They were sitting. They heard the sound as of a mighty rushing wind. Tongues of fire. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke in other tongues. Now, those who waited in that room, did you know they didn't know what kind of manifestation it was going to be? No one had to give them a course on manifestations. They just waited. And it happened. And when it happened, as you read Acts, all of Acts chapter 2, all of Acts chapter 3, all of Acts chapter 4 and 5, it was a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Thousands of people came to the Lord. There were signs. There were wonders. There were miracles. Even at the shadow of people, people were getting healed. How many are still out here with me? Amen. Amen. But then men and women come in, no, we need to do this, we need to do that, we need to do that, and we get away from the ways of God. Now, when you get away from the ways of God, this is where you get away from the anointing of God. The, the anointing of the local church is very precious. You must protect it. The anointing on your life is very precious. You must learn how to protect it. You see, you don't lose your anointing. A church doesn't lose the anointing because the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. What God gives us, he's not going to take away. But we can move away from it by going our way and doing things our way and not doing things God's way. Hello, everybody. Hello. Amen. Yes. As we were talking about yesterday, the... What the body of Christ is doing now, they're telling people, you're too old. We're going to put the young people in charge. And that's not God's way. <laughs> that's man's way. Are you all following what I'm saying? And sometimes you have certain believers now who are, who are of age, believe that they're pushed aside and they can't do anything anymore. Okay. And you got the young people jumping up and down and saying, we're in charge. Okay? And many times jumping up and down, 98% of it, there's no anointing. It's just jumping up and down. And once you know the anointing, you know the anointing. How many follow what I'm saying? Amen. And this is where we were looking at yesterday where the word, and this is going on all over the world. All over the world. All the pastors are parenting one thing. See, that's one thing about the body of Christ. What one does, the rest follows. He gets a lot of members over here. Oh, what is he doing? Let's do the same thing. You see, and everybody just runs. They don't, they don't see if it's scriptural. They just run and they do it. And believers are, I have to say this, are gullible. They just follow. Are you all following what I'm saying? I don't know why I'm getting into all this. The Holy Ghost is good. Can you say amen? You see, the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. The calling that God has on your life, he's not going to take that back. The impartation of anointing and gifting he's given you, he's not going to take that back. Now, you can move into it and flow with it and develop it, or you can move away from it. But it's still there for you. Let's finish this and then we'll go over there. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 8. Amen. And it says, I think we got to verse uh, 13. And when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold are multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, when your heart is lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Notice forgetting the Lord our God. And let's just go down to verse 17. Then you say in your heart. Now, this was the third aspect that we were talking about of pride. Then you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. 
And then you hear nothing but I, 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 I. <laughs> Okay, let's see. Verse 18, and you should remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Well, here we're to always follow God's way. We should always give God the glory. We're to always feed on his faithfulness. And feeding on his faithfulness is thanking the Lord, praising the Lord for what he's done and what he's doing in our particular life. You uh, saw that with Solomon. You saw that with David. Okay? And then you didn't see that with Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> and God warned him of it before it happened. But sometimes human beings don't take warnings. Let's go over to 1 Timothy a moment. Praise God forevermore. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus is good. Hallelujah. Let's go to 2 Timothy. Let's go back to 2 Timothy chapter 3 a moment. And as we were talking yesterday, there's God's ways, there's man's ways. And I think, okay, Holy Spirit, we'll go there first. First Timothy chapter 3. First Timothy chapter 3. We're talking about this yesterday. Don't feel discouraged because you're getting older. God does not set you on the sidelines. And if you have a place that sets you on the sidelines, leave that place and God will have you start a new place, or he will send you to a place. Are you all following what I'm saying? Amen. And this is not the corporate world, although you see many corporate churches. Okay, just be perfectly honest with you. Okay, we've been in this for quite a few years. <laughs> Praise God. First Timothy chapter 3 and we started looking at qualifications of a bishop, qualifications of a deacon, or qualifications of a pastor. And as I said, you don't put someone into something because they are young. And because you believe they are young, they're going to get other people, more people into your church. I saw a church in Taiwan been with many years and I knew the elders and God really blessed that church but moved that church but people got to a certain age and they kicked all the older people out and they put people in positions who were not really qualified yeah that church has suffered it suffered quite a lot Okay, and the Bible tells us here, well, I think we better go down here first, is that First Timothy chapter 3, verse 10, and it says here, this is about deacons, but let these also be tested. Or it says in the old King James, they must be proven. They must be proven. See, now that's God's, System. That's God's way of doing things. Is a person must be proven. You must be able to stand the pressure to be in that position. He will give it to you. As I shared yesterday. I had a, we were passing. We had this. We had uh, musicians. They were from big name groups. I tell you, some of them you know them. And this one particular brother. He wanted to be in charge of the music department because he was a renowned musician, okay? And the Lord spoke to me and told me, put him in charge of the music department, praise and worship. I said, okay, Lord. I heard from God. He lasted two weeks. <laughs> two weeks. 
Because once he stepped in that particular position, there was pressure like he had never experienced before because it was spiritual pressure. It was spiritual pressure. In other words, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principality, power, dominion, and spiritual wickedness in high places. See, there's a difference when you're playing beep, bop, boop, boop, ba, ba, beep, beep, doo, and when you're playing music that is praising and worshiping God because there is anointing and things are being broken. So the devil could you kill know, you can be bop, poop, 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 choop, 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 all you want to. But when it comes to doing it in the name of the Lord, you're a target. You all following what I'm saying? You're a target. And the devil is coming after you to knock you out of that position. And you have to learn how to stand and fight the good fight of faith and use the weapons of your warfare and chase the devil away. That is calling being steadfast. You looked at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, be steadfast, immovable. That's being immovable. This is what God has called me to do. It's not only for music. It's to be an usher. Whatever it is, when it comes to the things of the Lord, the devil does not like a person to do that. And he will attack them. And that's why the Bible says a person must be proven. That proven is being able to stand against the wiles of the enemy and also to show faithfulness in serving. See, sometimes people don't have faithfulness in serving. They serve one day, let's say, as a greeter. <laughs> and they greet people. They're so happy to be serving in the Lord. Then an irate person comes in. And that irate person says something to them. Uh, I don't think this serving is for me. <laughs> Boy, you all got quiet on me out there. How many follow what I'm saying? Amen. 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 Oh, like sometimes people come to a church. Oh, I just love your church. There's so much love. And then sister so-and-so scolds them about something. There's no love in this church. I need to find another one. <laughs> That's the enemy always trying to pull us away from what God has called us to do. These are what we call distractions. Distraction, trying to distract us, stop us from going forth in what God has called us to do. Amen? Even you purpose in your heart to fast. And the day you're supposed to fast, you get all invitations to lunch, dinners, people <laughs> bring you cake, bring you food, and all of those particular things. Now, I'm not saying the devil's using the people, but here is the temptation. Are you all following what I'm saying? And then, of course, the thought comes, oh, they, ah, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to hurt their feelings, so I better eat this anyway. <laughs> The devil said, I'm going to stop that fast. <laughs> You're all following what I'm saying. Man. Yeah, purpose in your heart to go on so many days of fast. Boy, the food just comes. I mean, it just comes. Can you say amen? All right. Well, let's go over now to 1 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to get back to 2 Timothy chapter 3. And it says in verse 1, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times of the latter days, that's us, some will depart from the faith. Now notice it says some will depart from the faith. That means they were with the faith. But now they have departed from the faith. And departing from the faith here means they have apostatized. They have knowingly given away their salvation. No one can take your salvation away from you. 
you have to meet the qualifications of Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Most Christians don't even know what salvation entails, to be perfectly honest with you. I used to have this lady who would come from Australia to Malaysia all the time. And she wanted me to pray for her because she wanted to get back with the Lord because she is no longer with the Lord. She's apostatized. And she visited me about three times. I prayed for her, and I tell her the same thing every time. I said, sister, someone who apostatized, they don't want to get back with the Lord. They're not going to come and say, please pray for me that the Lord will take me back because they know what they have done. Boy, you all got mighty quiet on me out there. Amen. Okay, like I would always say, if I had a seminar on demons, it would be packed. People queued outside. I give one on salvation, only a few people come and they think they know. And that is the most important seminar is the one of really understanding what salvation is because there's so many doctrines in salvation, justification, holiness, righteousness, grace. We can go on and on and on and on. Most Christians don't really know what they have. That's just a fact. But you're almighty quiet on me out there, but these are facts, okay? So it says, some will depart from the faith. They were with the faith. Why? Giving heed, number one, to deceiving spirits or seducing spirits. Seducing spirits. See, the word and the spirit always agree because the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible. The Holy Spirit is not going to tell us something outside of the word of God to do. It will always be in agreement. The spirit and the word always agree they never disagree he said oh but such and such well you may not know where it is but it's somewhere in the word of God that's why the Bible tells you and I to prove all things that responsibility rests upon us to prove all things okay so seducing spirits causes a person to depart from the faith. Seducing spirits are in the area of also false visions, visions that do not come from God, visions that come from the devil. Satan will give you a vision. He gave Jesus a satanic vision. Yes, he did. He took him up on the highest mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment in time and told him, all of this has been given to me and I give it to whomever I want to give it to. And I'll give it to you if you fall down and worship me. And that's what Jesus says, you should worship the only the Lord your God. You want to see that? Praise God, false vision. People get false vision sometimes. See, every vision must be prayed on, number one, and it must be proven whether or not it comes from God. Because God's not going to give you a vision and it's, it is not in agreement with his word. Let's look over to, I think we want to look at the book of Matthew. Praise God forevermore. About around Matthew chapter 4. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Matthew uh, chapter 4, hallelujah, and let's look at verse 8, Matthew 4 verse 8. Now, just because it is supernatural doesn't mean that it's from God, because there's a supernatural power of God, and there's a supernatural power of the devil. There's a spirit of truth and a spirit of error. That's very clear over in 1 John 4. Okay, and it says here in verse 8, and it says again, as the devil's coming at him, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain 
and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. Notice all the kingdoms of the world. You go up on a high mountain, you, your view is limited. Oh, you're seeing a lot, but it's limited. You're not going to be able to look, to look into another country unless that country is right next door to you, like Armenia and Turkey, where you see Mount Arat. Okay? And then it goes on and says, And he said to them, All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Amen. Jesus responded with the word of God. Can you say amen? amen. Now let's go back over to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Seducing spirits. Seducing spirits. Or it says in here, deceiving spirits and seducing spirits are deceiving spirits. And Doctrines of demons. What are doctrines of demons? Doctrines of demons are doctrines that are inspired by demons. A person receives a vision, which is not from God, and they receive instructions, which they call revelation, and they write it down and it becomes false doctrine, a doctrine that is inspired by demons. This is where people are led away from the truth. See, deception manifests itself by appearance and by statement. Those two areas. And that's why you have people worshiping false gods. For Christians in this particular area is getting away from what the truth says. Very, very, very simple. I mean, we can look at the area of deliverance. There's two areas that Christians get goofy in more than any other areas, and that's deliverance in end times. Those particular Areas, they just go off in, in la-la land somewhere. Okay. And I'll use the area of what you call uh, deliverance. Okay. The truth says, you and I have all power over all demons in Jesus' name. The truth says that Satan is under our feet. The truth says we're to tread on serpents and scorpions and have all power over the enemy's power and nothing by any means shall hurt us. The truth says he spoiled principality, power, dominion, made a show out of them openly, triumphing them over in it. Okay? We can go on and on with what the truth says. There's no name named above the name of Jesus. In heaven, earth, under the earth, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Okay? In other words, you and I don't have to be afraid of demons. We're to cast out demons. So, in Christian bookstores, and the devil invades those too. Our Christians online, he really invades those. Okay? If you read anything that makes you afraid of the devil, that says you cannot cast out the devil unless you have this and this and this and this, that's a doctrine that is inspired by demons. You all following what I'm saying? And it causes a person to be reluctant to cast out demons. That's why you must always go to the word of God. Always go to the word of God. Can you say amen? amen. Sometimes people believe I can't cast out the devil. If I go cast out that devil, he's coming after me. <laughs> so they don't do it. They run away from it. Okay, not to be that particular way. I remember, and this was in India, and Shanti was there. She was a student at that particular time. Luke was a prophecy. 
<laughs> Praise God forevermore. We have mass evangelistic meeting, okay? And in India, the pastors love to sit on the platform, okay? Place of honor. And there are about 40 pastors sitting on the platform, okay? So it was time to minister to people. Holy Ghost fell. People started getting healed. Demons started coming out. All kind of good things were happening, exciting things. Can you say amen? So we have all these pastors on the platform. We have Shanti and Regina, two little girls. <laughs> and they prayed for this one particular man who was genuinely demon-possessed. In other words, he was not a habitual manifester. He was really demon-possessed. They started praying for him. The demons started coming out of him. His face turned bright red. His eyes got red. His voice was a voice of something that they had never heard. And do you know all those 40 pastors jumped off the platform <laughs> and left the two of them to get that particular man free. I mean, they were, you could have dropped something and boom, they were gone just that fast. That's right, I'm talking about pastors. They're supposed to know how to do these things. Are you all following what I'm saying? They were gone. So we had a, we had a clear platform after they left <laughs> and they never returned after that. And God was performing all kinds of miracles. Blind eyes, deaf ears, crippled walking, demons coming out of people, all kind of miracles, tumors disappearing. That's nothing for Jesus. That's easy. Can you say amen? amen. Glory be to God. Now, doctrines inspired of demons would tell you you're not able to do that. Don't pay attention to anything where God has said, you can do it. And then someone else comes along and says, cannot, cannot. Don't pay attention to anything like that. That's error. You all stand out there with me. Amen. We'll take a break and we'll come back to our next session. Amen. Hallelujah.